Okay, could you just tell us your name and how long you've been in Carroll County? My name's George W. Murphy. I've been in Carroll County since 1994. 1994, wow. Um, and you've become very interested in African-American history in the county. Um, and I know you've specifically looked at um, some of the African-Americans from the county who served in the Civil War. Um, how did you get interested in that? Well, I uh, was a member of the Carroll County Historical Society and I researched on the, their microfilm room to find the obituaries of people who had died and were buried in Ellsworth Cemetery. And over the years, I accumulated a, a quite a few biographies and obituaries of Civil War veterans who served in the Civil War and were, in fact, buried at Ellsworth Cemetery. I am the president of the Ellsworth Cemetery Company and am in the process of restoring Ellsworth and two or three other historic black cemeteries in Baltimore County keeping alive the memory of all those men who served in the Civil War. Great. Well, could you tell us a little bit about some of the African-American Civil War veterans that you've learned about? More African-Americans from Maryland won the Congressional Medal of Honor in the Civil War than from any other state. Six men of color, as they were called in those days, won the Congressional Medal of Honor who were born in Maryland. Alfred Hilton, Christian Fleetwood, James H. Harris, William Barnes, all received the Congressional Medal of Honor for the Battle of Chapin Farms. William H. Brown received the Congressional Medal of Honor while he was in the Navy for participating in the Battle of Mobile Bay. And Decatur Dorsey, who was, whose wife lived in Howard County and whose children were raised right across the river from Sykesville, won the Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions at the Battle of the Crater. These men, the ones who participated in the Battle of Chapin's Farms, cracked the outer defenses of the city of Richmond close to the end of the war. The 4th United States Colored Troops were assigned the task of breaking this ring of defenses that was designed by Robert E. Lee. It was a very elaborate set of defenses. It was almost impregnable. And as they assaulted the area, over half the color guard were shot and killed right on the spot. And one man, Alfred Hilton, seized the regimental colors, which are represented here. This is a my rendering of what those regimental colors looked like. He saved the colors twice. The original color bearer was shot and he picked up that flag and as the citation for the Congressional Medal of Honor states, he seized the regimental colors in one hand and the national standard in the other and advanced forward. And then he was shot through the leg. He died three weeks later of his wounds and was given the medal posthumously. But as he was dying, he shouted out, boys, save the colors. And he passed the flag to Christian Fleetwood of Baltimore, who carried those colors. And the initial assault failed because over half the men of the fourth were shot or wounded right on the spot. And Fleetwood used the national standard that he received from Hilton and rallied the men and they charged a second time, overcame two walls of spikes and a wooden palisade, and took the position and cracked the outer defenses of Richmond. William Barnes and James H. Harris were the first two men to climb over the wooden palisade, and they received the Congressional Medal of Honor. James H. Harris's citation is the most eloquent and briefest of all, it simply says, gallantry in the assault. Mr. Barnes, who was from St. Mary's County, was wounded in the leg, but still accompanied his friend, Mr. Harris, in climbing the palisade and cracking the defenses of Richmond. I mentioned William H. Brown. Mr. William H. Brown was from Maryland as well. He was 
were a participant in the Battle of Mobile Bay. Mobile, Alabama was the only port in the Confederacy that was still open to blockade runners. And Admiral Farragut designed a plan where they would take a flotilla of 18 ships into Mobile Bay through a narrow channel and attack Fort Morgan, which had huge naval batteries, and take on the largest ironclad of the war, the Tennessee, which was the largest ironclad of the Confederacy. And in the very first boat, which was the USS Brooklyn, Mr. Brown served in the powder room, a very dangerous position. And the Brooklyn was the first to go through as the harbor was laid with mines, as or in those days they called them torpedoes. And the Brooklyn had a long spar on its bow, which was designed to catch the torpedoes and keep them from hitting the Hartford, which Farragut was on. And as they crossed through, one Union ironclad, the Tecumseh, broke formation and went off on its own, promptly hit a mine and sunk. 90 men died in 60 minutes, 60 seconds or so. The whole boat exploded and went down. And the whole flotilla stopped. And that's when Farragut, who was tied up in the main mast, just so he could stay there for his own safety, noticed everybody was slowing down. He called down to his second in command and said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And that's when the Hartford and the Brooklyn kept going. and confronted the Tennessee. And the Tennessee was outnumbered 17 to 1, and the Union forces, despite its immense size, forced the Tennessee to surrender. They damaged the batteries of Fort Morgan, and ultimately, the Battle of Mobile Bay was a victory for the Union. Mr. Brown's citation was that even though he was working with the gunpowder, which was extremely dangerous, one bad spark, and he would have been blown to pieces. Twice the decks around him were cleared of men by shell and canister, and he, along with other men, picked up the dead and stacked them neatly in rows and kept sh passing the powder to the cannon so the battle could continue. And in those days, the United States Navy was not segregated the United States Army was, therefore, the black troops in the Civil War were organized in the United States colored troops. But the Navy did not recognize whether some, who could float and who could not. If you went down with the ship, you went down with the ship. So there was no segregation in the United States Navy. Decatur Dorsey won his Congressional Medal of Honor for his heroic actions at the Battle of the Crater. Decatur Dorsey was a very, very local man. He was born a slave and was born and lived and worked on the, the plantations in southern Frederick County owned by the Dorsey family. Decatur Dorsey carried the national standard for the, four, for the fourth United States colored troops at the beginning of the Battle of the Crater. The Battle of the Crater was the most bloody conflict for the United States Colored Troops in the Civil War. More men of color died in that battle than in any other. Decatur Dorsey came upon a battlefield as large as a football field with a huge hole in the ground and mud and blood and bodies everywhere. Behind him, he had a 1,000 men. And rather than lead his men into the pit where the explosion occurred, he led them around the pit, which saved many lives planted his flag upon the intact Confederate works, went back to the 4th United States Colored Troops, pointed to the flag and says, charge. As a result, the 4th United States Colored Troops attacked that part of the defenses that the, that the Confederacy had, captured over 200 prisoners, six battle flags, and that particular day was a horrible day for the Union Army. And Decatur Dorsey and the 4th United States Colored Troops fought the only redeeming part of that battle for the Union. Everything else was a complete loss. Thousands of men died. And the Battle of Petersburg was not like 
the Battle of Fort Wagner that was portrayed in the movie Glory. The Battle of Fort Wagner occurred over a 16-hour period. The Battle of Petersburg was a 10-month siege, more like World War I in memory than what we usually think of the Civil War. It was a long grind. It cost thousands of lives. And Decatur Dorsey saved the lives of many of the 4th United States Colored Troops by leading them away from the large pit that had been opened up. That's why they call it the Battle of the Crater, because the Union had installed 5,000 pounds of gunpowder underneath the outer defenses of Petersburg and exploded it, resulting in a large pit larger than this studio. And three white regiments were ordered in. Their commander, Colonel Lindsay, the next day was fired by Ulysses S. Grant because he spent the entire battle in a bomb proof drinking brandy. And the three white regiments were trapped in this pit and five regiments of United States Colored Troops were ordered in to try and save them and save the situation. But it was a hopeless task because there were more than enough Confederate soldiers with plenty of ammunition. At this point in the war, Robert E. Lee was still very, very well armed. And there was no way they could rescue the three white regiments. And in fact, as a defeat, it was one of the greatest the Union suffered in the war. A lot of people talk about the battle at Fort Pillow, where perhaps 150 United States Colored Troops were murdered by Nathan Bedford Forrest after they had surrendered. My research indicates that at the Battle of the Crater, more black troops were killed by Confederates than at the Fort Pillow. In fact, there was a written account, which I have read, that as the troops were led out of the crater, the Confederate soldiers would say, save the white man, kill the black. And as the black soldiers came out of the crater, they were bayoneted and killed on the spot. So it is undoubtedly true that more black Union soldiers were mur murdered at the Battle of the Crater than at Fort Pillow. And Decatur Dorsey was the hero to the Union of that day because they gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor for being brave and heroically brave, almost insanely brave. He was leading a thousand men. He was safe. He had a thousand of his friends behind him and he left them behind and ran all across the battlefield and planted that flag right underneath artillery and waved his colleagues on. So Decatur Dorsey, the man who geographically lived right across from the Carroll County town of Sykesville, whose wife and children were raised right across the river from the town of Sykesville, was one of the six United States Colored Troops to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor during the Civil War. Now, I know you, you mentioned that you're president of the Ellsworth Cemetery Company. Um, how did Ellsworth Cemetery get started? Ellsworth Cemetery was founded legally in 1876 when the Articles of Incorporation for the Ellsworth Cemetery Company of Carroll County were signed. It was signed by six black Union Army veterans. They received the land on which the cemetery sits for the consideration of one dollar by Mr. John W. Reese. And they set it aside for the burial of the colored residents of Westminster. In those days, in 1876, it was illegal for a person of color to be buried within the city limits of Westminster. And Ellsworth became the place for blacks in Carroll County to be buried. It is the oldest and largest of the black cemeteries in Carroll County and is uh, still in the process of being fully restored to this day. And so it didn't matter that these black men were uh, Union Army veterans, they still could not be buried no. within the city. No, in the city limits of Westminster, according to the town ordinances of those days, they were, it was be considered to be polluting the ground for people of color or Native Americans to be buried within the town limits of the Caucasian city of Westminster. 
In fact, even the term colored was actually a step forward because colored was always capitalized as in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People because colored with a capital C was considered the legal equivalent of white with a capital W. It was a statement of equality and in its day a statement of hope. Are there any specific um, veterans who lived within Carroll County that you know of, that among the Medal of Honor winner, winners or stories? Uh, Decatur Dorsey's wife lived right. right next to Carroll County. He grew up in Frederick County and he was part of a plantation that in fact went across county lines. It was so large, thousands of acres. That's where he lived and worked. There are other Civil War veterans like Ephraim Smith, Daniel Warfield, who are buried in Ellsworth Cemetery right now. Daniel Warfield joined the Union Army at the tender age of 16, and he was in the battle formations outside the Battle of Cold Harbor, where Grant lost 5,000 men in 20 minutes, and all Daniel Warfield had to protect himself was a drum. He was a drummer boy at 16 in the Union Army, and he is buried at Ellsworth Cemetery. Wow. That's amazing. It's hard to believe that when we look at the armies now, you don't see the, the drummers out there in, in, in the battle with the troops. In those days, with the musketry, 58 caliber bullets and black powder, you couldn't see anything after the first shots because of the, the, the smoke. So drummers were very important because they could be heard over the gunshots and as the cadence of the drums changed, orders changed, retreat, attack, advance. And the color bearers were very important. They were always the first one shot by the enemy because they held the, the flags up high so all the members of the regiment could see it and they always followed the flag. So it was very important at the Battle of Chapin's Farm for the Confederates once the 4th United States Colored Troops advanced, they all fired at once and they literally killed and wounded everybody in the Colored Guard. The only one who survived the first assault was of course Alfred Hilton who saved the regimental colors and passed the national colors on to Christian Fleetwood. But the color bearer was always followed and the drummers were very important because just the cadence of the drum were the orders that the men could understand and hear. Oh. What, are there any artifacts here in the county um, that speak to the African-American Civil War vets or soldiers, as I, you mentioned the reading things at the Historical Society. Do they have any specific artifacts? Or? Well, they have my painting of the uh, Fourth United States Color Troop Regimental flag on sale there. And when I was restoring Ellsworth Cemetery, I retrieved from underground a stone carved by Boss Hammond which is now in the Reginald Lewis Museum in downtown Baltimore. It was rescued in Carroll County and then donated to the Reginald, Museum, Reginald Lewis Museum in Baltimore. It was my privilege to uh, pass that on to Reginald Lewis along with uh, Gene Lewis, Alice Green, and myself in the Historical Society. In the microfilm records, the American Sentinel newspaper, which was the newspaper of the Republican Party in Carroll County, in the Historical Society, if you go back to the 1860s and start reading the accounts of the battles as it was posted in the paper of record of the day, you'll see a very equitable and fair mention of the role of colored troops within the Republican Party newspaper. In those days, the Democratic Advocate was the party of the Democratic Party, very much the newspaper of slavery and of segregation, and they covered these events in a completely different way. Many obituaries in the American Sentinel newspaper mentioned quite favorably the conduct and the military records 
of black troops who had served in the Civil War. It's hard to find the same treatment in the Democratic Advocate, but those records are there, and if you want to go to the Historical Society to their reading room, you can explore this area. It's fascinating to me. What do you think the legacy of that time is for now as you, you look back, you spent a lot of time doing this historical research. What is the legacy of, of these men that, that served in the Civil War, um, these African-American men? I think they, they accurately and effectively changed the way we view history. Everybody talks about February being Black History Month, but to my mind, you cannot talk about history in a general sense without including the contributions of African Americans because they were vital not only to the Union victory in the Civil War, their labor was vital to the building of the Capitol, the White House, and many of the great mansions that are in Maryland and in the South. You cannot accurately talk about history without talking about African Americans and their contributions. And when they died by the thousands for their own freedom in the Civil War, they proved once and for all that their role could not be stereotyped, that they were there to serve their own interests. And it is important that when the Grand Army of the Republic in Carroll County, specifically in New Windsor, was formed, the black Union soldiers who formed that branch of the Grand Army of the Republic named their chapter for a white man, Thaddeus Stevens, because he was an abolitionist, an early defector from the Whig Party to the Republican Party. And when those six black veterans formed the Ellsworth Cemetery of Carroll County, they named their cemetery for Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, who was a personal friend of Abraham Lincoln, who worked for him as a law clerk in Springfield, Illinois, and who was the first Union officer killed in the Civil War. And when Colonel Elmer Ellsworth died, Lincoln had his body brought back to the White House. And, and in the East Room, they laid Elmer Ellsworth out, and a visitor said he could see President Lincoln staring off in the, through a window, and he talked, he said, President Lincoln, and as Lincoln turned to him, he could see tears coming down his face. And ironically, Ulysses S. Grant, the ultimate victorious general in the Civil War, re-enrolled in the Union Army after reading of Elmer Ellsworth's death, which occurred in Alexandria, Virginia, when the Virginia voted to secede from the Union. It made national news. Elmer Ellsworth, in his day, was one of the most famous soldiers of the United States. There were dolls boys played with in those days, dolls of suaves, soldiers with red pants, uh, blue shirts that were the G.I. Joe of the 1860s, and Elmer Ellsworth was the commander of the Fire Zouaves of New York, and as such, he was the original G.I. Joe. And little boys who played with the dolls of the Zouave soldiers in the 1860s are the equivalent today of the boys who play with G.I. Joe. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, in terms of the, the Civil War, um, in your research, did you find anything about the, the conflicts within Carroll County, within the families, within family uh, farmers who owned slaves, farmers who did not? The, uh, one of our most famous families is the Shriver family. It was divided bitterly and deeply when uh, Jeb Stewart came through Westminster and went up to Union Mills. One branch of the Shriver family laid out a feast for him, while other members of the same family were waiting for him in Gettysburg. So the Shriver family was split right down the middle, and the associations of many prominent Carroll Countyans, including 
Betsy Patterson, who grew up in Springfield on her father's plantation. She went on to become the wife of Louis Napoleon or Napoleon III of France. And while Napoleon III of France was married to Carroll County's Betsy Patterson, he strongly considered recognizing the Confederacy because he was in love with his wife and his wife was the daughter of a rich slaveholder in Maryland. So in that sense, the divisions within Carroll County had international implications. If one bell, a beauty of Carroll County, could influence the course of history of France recognizing or not recognizing the Confederacy, it shows how profound the divisions were everywhere in Carroll County and in Maryland. Do you think that the black Civil War veterans received recognition at the time of the Civil War, or did it take a while for that recognition to come? Well, after the Civil War, there was a whole cultural wave about the, the lost cause of the Confederacy. And historian after historian romanticized the role of Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis in the war because they portrayed them as the underdog. But more recently, history has started to balance the scales and the popular movie Glory gives an appropriate and fairly realistic depiction of how battle was conducted in the Civil War, how in fact, how much courage it took just to stand on a field that was being raked by canister and shot much less the average ammunition. Remember a 58 caliber mini ball that was the standard bullet used was bigger than my thumb and made of soft lead. So if it would hit you in the shoulder, that's why there were so many amputations. It broke every bone in your shoulder and in a lot of cases tore your arm off and what was left had to be amputated. The horrors of the Civil War were very, very real. And there, at the Battle of the Crater, Simon Murdoch, who along with his brother Isaac, joined the 4th United States Colored Troops, was wounded, and he had a hit with shrapnel, and he had a depressed skull fracture on one side of his head, and received a disability pension from the Union Army. As a result, he had his own home in Wakefield Valley, and he could afford a home because he had a Union pension and did not have to depend upon being a day laborer or a farmer or a slave for an income. He had an independent income that did not depend upon the local economy, which was very important to their prosperity. And is one reason why Ellsworth Cemetery at one time was a Victorian garden of marble sculptures, as beautiful as any cemetery you would want to see in the world. Even to this day, we have beautiful sculptures of children's shoes and feet, angels, and the most elaborate tombstone in Ellsworth Cemetery is for the founder of the Union Street United Methodist Church, John Baptiste Snowden. It is an eight-stage marble monument around 11 foot tall with a vase upon the top. And John Baptiste Snowden was born a slave, purchased his own freedom from the Bennett family and his monument is the tallest one in Ellsworth. He, he founded the Union Street United Methodist Church on Union Street in Westminster, and his descendants still live in Carroll County to this day. So aside from the Medal of Honor winners that you've mentioned, um, was there general recognition um, within the state of Maryland of the African-American troops that served in the Civil War, or was that downplayed? That was immediately downplayed. You have to remember, Maryland actually voted against, the majority of the white population in Maryland voted against the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which the Civil War had been fought over. There was a great deal of cultural resentments against blacks in general in Maryland. and. By formal vote after formal vote, majority of voters in Maryland rejected the 14th and 15th Amendment. It is ironic that the year after Carroll County was created in 1837, in 1838, Frederick Douglass forged his pass on the Philadelphia Baltimore 
and Wilmington Railroad to walk out of Baltimore and get to freedom to Pennsylvania. And he had to write a pass, forge his master's name in order to get permission to go on the train, even to get out of the state of Maryland. Such were the obstacles to blacks moving, crossing state lines, or even getting on any means of public conveyance in Maryland at the time. And do you, do you see a time when that shifted toward recognition, or do you think this is still an overlooked piece of history? I still, it's, it's an area that is overlooked. It hasn't been ver explored very deeply, although I spent a lot of time doing it and enjoy it. In the general scheme of things, the Civil War is still presented as being caused by the battle for states' rights. It was first and foremost, in my mind, a racial war. Because when Jeb Stewart came through Westminster with his 5,000 men, the civilians he shot on the street, almost all of them were black. And when he stopped at on Main Street at the office of the Carroll Guards, the only men left to prevent, stand in his way from breaking into the office of the Carroll Guards, the Union soldiers of Westminster were black men. He shot them, he pistol whipped them, he threw them in the backs of wagons and carried them to Gettysburg, where on the 4th of July, the Confederacy lost the tide in the Civil War. But Jeb Stuart very much was one of the reasons why so many blacks turned out for the Union Army. They heard very quickly what had happened in Westminster the day he came through, who he shot, who he kidnapped, and what happened and they came out by the scores and signed up to join the 4th and 39th United States Colored Troops, many of whose members were from Carroll County. And if it hadn't been for the actions of Jeb Stewart and the way he conducted himself, uh, they may have been very slow to join the Union Army, but they joined by the scores. Brothers marched off together. Even white slaveholders as far away as Finksburg were so shocked by Jeb Stewart's conduct, one of them even put his slave, Mr. Mac Philip McAllister, in his carriage and drove him down to Baltimore City and had him sign up with Colonel Birney of the 39th United States Colored Troops. Colonel Birney wrote this plantation under a glowing letter saying, patriotic slaveholders such as yourself give us hope. So that even slaveholders were, you're saying, were... Were shocked and revolted by the violence and the, the looting. You have to remember that this was a civil war, much like we discussed. We see the results of the civil war in Syria with all the toll on families, hundreds of thousands of killed, everything of value and every mark of civilization destroyed. That's what the Civil War did in Maryland. No town escaped the sorrow, particularly not Westminster. Can you talk about that a little bit more? The town of Westminster itself was uh, potentially what was going to be where Gettysburg was fought, if not for the maneuvering of Robert E. Lee to carry himself further north in Pennsylvania, Meade anticipated that around where Union Mills is today, he would send thousands of Union troops by rail from Baltimore to Westminster to fight a decisive battle against Robert E. Lee. But for an accident of geography, Jeb Stewart would not have been riding to Gettysburg to see Lee. He would have already arrived and seen Lee here because the Battle of Gettysburg could have taken place right here in and around Westminster very easily. Interesting. Are there any other things you'd like to say about the African-American soldiers in the Civil War? What distinguishes them was the level of casualties that they had. It was not unusual for units such as the 4th United States Colored Troops, which began with a thousand men to end the Civil War with only 500 standing in their ranks and an additional 1,000 already dead or wounded 
died of disease, the uh, level of sacrifice that they participated in the Civil War late in the war. And late in the war was when Robert E. Lee, who was a genius of an engineer, had laid out fixed defenses. And Ulysses S. Grant would lose 5,000 men a day. And one fourth of his army was United States colored troops. So as the, the war was ending, the bloodiest battles were fought day after day after day. And the United States colored troops were there to wear down the Confederacy and attack fixed defenses with enormous losses. And it took heroic sacrifice and great selflessness for these men to participate at the time. The men in the 4th United States Colored Troops, when they began the Civil War, got paid a grand total of $7 a month for their service. And the 54th Massachusetts, the unit that was made famous by the movie Glory, had a battle, had a battle cry. It was hurrah for the state of Massachusetts and hurrah for $7 a month. The United States colored troops would die for $7 a month and there was absolutely no doubt in their minds. Particularly at Appomattox, at the end of the war, the 39th was cited as a unit for its bravery because as Robert E. Lee was looking for a way out of Appomattox and to escape, he sent out cavalry to find out what was going on in the valleys. When they went down to the valleys, they found that there was a blue wall surrounding them. And part of that blue wall was the men of the 39th United States Colored Troops. At the time, these men did not realize that Robert E. Lee was down to his last 20 cannon, that he only had 28,000 men. They didn't know whether he had 20 cannon or 200 cannon. They didn't know or care whether they only had 28,000 troops or 100,000 troops. They knew this, that if Grant said charge, they would. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. You're welcome. Good morning, we're here with Mr. Lewis Brown Sr., a well-known community member of Western Chapel um, um, in that African-American community. We are so pleased to have you here this morning, Mr. Brown. I have a question, why is Western Chapel important in the African-American community in Carroll County? Well, to me, I have a lot of heritage around here and I grew up here from a child up, and it's back in 1949, I guess, a little, maybe a little before that. Things were a little rough for us, but uh, as the years went by, things got better. And I just like it around here. Now, what contributions have your family made in this community since you grew up as a child here? Well, they grew up very poor, my family, and they've always been uh, God-fearing people, you know, of tourist committee, and That's about all I can say about that. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the historic cemetery that was built in the Western, um, Western Chapel community. Well, as, as a child growing up, I guess I was about 14 or 15, my father was a caretaker there. Okay. And uh, we used to dig graves by hand, take us all day. And I, he'd give me a couple of dollars. Of course, you only got about fifteen, twenty dollars to dig a grave. Right now, you get anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred to dig a grave, and on the weekends, it's more. And the reason why that I took it over because I have a grandfather there, and grandmother, and aunts and uncles, and my whole family's buried there. So, and when my aunt 
just before she got sick, she called me over because she lived. We, my grandparents owned nine acres out in the country, and that's when it was dirt road. And she called me over and she said, uh, she called me Sonny. She said, Sonny, I got something here I want you to take care of. So I never opened it up till I got over to my house. And when I opened it up, it was this deed and a bank book with $15 in it. That's what, you know, they had balance of it. So I went back over and I talked to her about it and I said, well, and I called her Ann Sis. I said, Ann Sis, I said, you sure this is all right? It doesn't belong to the conference or, you know, whatever? She said, well, it's sort of a community thing where they had field stones, they gathered it up, and that's how they built that church. And uh, on the deed, it tells you who purchased the property to the trustees. And I'll get myself straight. And so I took it over in uh, 201. And then I went to the distant superintendent mm -hmm. and asked him what I should do about the church down there. Well, it was just church ground okay. in a cemetery because the church had been destroyed. So he said, well, send me some literature on it and I'll see what I can do. Well, when they looked at their files, they didn't know nothing about the church being there. So he said, if you want it, you send me X amount of dollars and I'll make you a new deed out. I'll have my lawyer to do a title search and see if anybody's living that's on that old deed. And if not, it'll be yours. So that's how I wound up with it. I paid for it. I have a new deed, I have the old deed. And he said, what you need to do is get a committee. Well, I had six guys on the committee, but when they found out that there wouldn't be no money involved for our pockets, everybody dropped out with one person, Kevin Dorman. He was faithful. And during that time, in uh, 21, I had a, 2001, I had a heart attack. And I had one back to back, and I had a fibrillator, and a pacemaker, and all that good stuff put in me. But he continued to keep on working. And he would come down to the hospital every evening when he got finished and said, well, I did this and I did that. What you want me to do tomorrow? I said, well, Kevin, whatever you see fit to do, you do. And that's how I got a hold of it. And we planted grass seed, and I had a couple of volunteers come up with heavy equipment because it was full of trees. You could only see 10 feet from the dirt road into the cemetery. And every time they had a burial, from them 10 feet back, they had to dig a path to find out where the grave lots was in order to bury these people. But that was all done by hand back in those days. And then how they're being done. Now, I hear you saying now that you own that burial, plot, that burial yeah, land. Yeah, it's in my name and everything. That yes, is sir. great. Now. Let me ask you this now: Have people c are coming to you now, asking for plots and things yeah, of that nature? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll tell you oh. about that. Okay. Then, <clears throat> shortly after I took it over, some people had died, and of course you got family graves there, you know. And they would come and they say to me, uh, "Mama left me this, or Daddy left me this, or Grandpa left me this." I said, "Well, I don't have no records of that." I said, you're going to have to pay, which I only charge $650, because that took care of the upkeep of the cemetery, right? Because it's a tax write-off. Correct. And, uh, well, they gave me a bunch of, you know, you know whatever. Mm -hmm. So finally they paid it, and I've sold a couple of grave lots out of it, and then a lot of people dug their own graves. Okay. Yeah, back in the older days. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And then... There's a lot of graves there that just had old field stones for markers. Mm -hmm. But I had a good friend of mine, he went on the internet and got 
practically everybody that was buried there, and it's all listed. I have all papers that thick of everybody's buried there, and I have a plot where I had made up where the graves are. They start from 21, no, 19 on down in this road, and then down this road, down that road. Everything is numbered. Okay. And the way I find a grave that I'm not sure of, I have a four foot bar. Mm -hmm. And I'll take the hammer, drive it down, and if I hit a vault, it'll sound like a bell. Okay. And if I hit a rough box back in the days, it'll sink. Okay. All the way down six foot. Mm -hmm. I lose the bar. Ooh. So that's how I find the graves. Okay, all right. Now, yeah. has Boss Hammond did any type of headstones for you during that time? Boss Hammond? Uh -huh, Boss no, Hammond. no. No, okay. I had some literature on him. Yeah, though. right, yeah. okay. Yeah. Because I know he was a very well-known um, yeah, person yeah, to yeah. do um, headstones. Yeah, and then another thing, I forgot that. When uh, I started to take it over, New Windsor said that it belonged to them. So my lord, he had to write them a letter and give them X amount of days to have proof that it belonged to them before I could take it over, right? Okay. Well, they didn't do so, so. New Windsor? Church. Okay, New yeah, Windsor yeah, Church. Yeah, the trustees okay. up there said it belonged to them. Okay, okay. You talking about Strawbridge? Y yes, Strawbridge, Okay, yeah. all right, all right. Okay. Yeah, but it was only, like I say, a family get together out there. And during my times, until 1950 or 51, it was only about four houses out there. My parents, grandparents owned nine acres on one side, and on the other side there was a man named uh, Old Man Ness. He owned 11 acres, mm -hmm. one end of the road to the other. Well, this is predominantly African-American community? Yes, it's, a, it's only blacks out there at okay. that time. Let me ask you, describe Western Chapel um, before and during the civil rights era, how was that? How what did it look like? How was it formed? You know, things of that nature. Oh, it was uh, dirt road and and weeds. I mean, everything was growing up. You just had a little dog path, you know, just a little narrow road, dirt road to go. You couldn't keep your windows up because in the summertime, dust would fly, mm. you know, in your windows. Mm -hmm. And there was a church. I mean, a, a, a building across from the church, and those, which was my wife's uncle, they still own it. It's uh, three acres in there, but the foundation is just there. Okay. But they all stuck together. And then during the winter, us younger guys, and with my father and a couple of old ones, we would get granite sack bags and go to the store, we had to walk in town when it snowed, mm -hmm. I don't know, when we had big snows, and carry groceries back, you know, what we could. It would take us all day to get to town and go back. Mm -hmm. It was three and a half miles. Mm -hmm. Now, when did they start putting roads in? Um, was it during the Civil Rights era or after the after. Civil Rights era? After. Really? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, I'd say. Who was, the, who was the person who started that charge to get roads into Western Chapel. Do you remember? No, that I don't remember. Okay. All right. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. but now, that, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was back in, I guess, 48, 47, somewhere long back in there. Mm -hmm. Now, were they actual roads or were they gravel? No, 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 just dirt roads. I mean, before they put, I mean, after they put in when they put in the roads. They put blacktop in. Blacktop, yeah, okay. Yeah, blacktop, okay. yeah, blacktop. Okay. But it, it was rut so deep, sometimes they'd have to, some of the farmers had mules, they would take mules and pull the cars down to the highway. Oh my goodness, okay. Yeah, it was rough sledding. And most people had wood stoves. And mm -hmm. Didn't have no insulation in your houses at that time. Right. You know, just little brick. And then the small labs. Mm -hmm. had more, you could keep warm right outside and you could inside. You had to sit on top of the stove <laughs> to keep warm. <laughs> now, if people wanted to um, purchase a plot from you, they mm -hmm. would just call you? Yeah, they just call and me. What, and then, what's your information? 
And then I would ask them to come out and mm -hmm. pick out a spot because I had quite a bit to sell, you know, mm -hmm. okay. to keep the church Lord going. Okay. And I would let them pick out the spot, then I would take my bar and sound it. Mm -hmm. It would be uh, four foot wide, nine foot long, because you have to have space for the vault to go in. Okay. And I would do that as many graves as they wanted. Okay. I would sound all that out to make sure there's no graves in there. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what's your telephone number so people get in touch with you? Say what? What's your telephone number so people can get in touch with you? 848-9246. 848-9246. Okay, great. I have one more question for mm -hmm. you. Um, how would you describe Western Chapel's com community commitment in the past? In the past? Mm -hmm. It was fairly decent, I guess. Mm -hmm. People helping people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Neighborhood, like neighborhood watching. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like if you got in trouble, every, everybody in the neighborhood knew that you got yeah, in trouble. Yeah, well, they called me the mayor anyhow. <laughs> oh, did they? <laughs> <laughs> they? Why so? Huh? Why did they call you the mayor? Because I'm retired and I watch everything going on. Okay, you know. all right. Yeah, they, some mm -hmm. of them come tell me now, uh, they call me Sonny. Sonny, mm -hmm. I'm going away now. Watch my house. I oh, say, okay. I got it covered. <laughs> okay, good. So they still, in the presence, they still have that close commitment. Community yeah, yeah, ties. yeah. Everyone gets along. And if we have uh, new neighbors move, move in like it's moving in now, mm -hmm. uh, we have one lady out there, Patricia. She'll take them a, a dish up, you know, whatever. They got little kids, she'll take cookies up for them or mm -hmm. a casserole roll dish, you know. Everybody looks out for everybody. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. Where do you see the Western Chapel community moving into the future? Where do you see them growing? How do you see them growing in the future? Now, like you said, you were 82. You're going to be 82 years old. Next year. Next year. Okay. January. January. So where would you want that community to be in the future? I'd like to see a little store out there somewhere. Okay. But, you know, it's... A lot of people out there, more so than it was before, because there's only five houses out there on our road. Mm -hmm. But now you got, I think it's about 12 houses out there in just that one block. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You know, Western Chapel Road. Right. Where would you place it? Huh? Where would you place the store? The store? Uh huh. If you if you were to get a store out there. Where oh, would there's, you? there's a lot of open spaces down there, down below Boot there. And rabbit, that, that whole field is oh, empty. Right, yeah. right, right. That, I forgot about that. Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, with this, with Western Chapel community, what legacy would Lewis Brown Sr. like to leave in that community? What would you like to leave? What, you, what would you like to be remembered as besides the mayor of Western Chapel? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to... I uh, think people think that uh, I did what was right for the community because taking that over and now it's what's on my mind now is who's going to take care of it after I'm gone. That runs across my mind. I pray on it every night mm -hmm. because my son, he's not well. Mm -hmm. I only had one son up here. You know, I lost one son. Right. And that runs through my mind day in and day out because on New Windsor Road, they had a colored cemetery there, right? Mm -hmm. And they dug it up and put that new road there, 31 through there. Right. And put that up New Windsor. Okay. And the same thing could happen down there. If they wanted to widen the road and nobody's in charge of it, right. they could destroy it, you know. Which you're not supposed to destroy them. But. Mm -mm. So now we need to look for someone to be your, um, I get, yeah, your, the second in command, right? In order to get that yeah, still yeah, going. Yeah. Well, we need to work on that. Yeah. Well, I've been working on. It. I have a lot of young kids come out and say, "Let me know when you're gonna cut grass." We're well, doing the summer, you okay. know, grass roads, right? Right. If it rains. Right. So you don't have to ask me to come out. Come on out and cut it. Well, you're, you're working in the 21st century, so yeah, you might have to ask them. Right, right. And if they don't get paid for it, they don't want to do it. Right. Well, yeah. some people might need um, community, community service. Yeah. So. Yeah, I had a lot of college kids come out there last summer and mm -hmm. picked up sticks and stuff. You know? Oh, good, good. And then I also 
get back to the graveyard. When I first took it over, I sent out letters. Had my wife type them up because she's my secretary. <laughs> <laughs> and asked for a small donation, you know, just to, for the upkeep of the cemetery. Mm -hmm. I quit sending them out because I was wasting money in stamps. I get two, two donations a year. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking for donations as well. Yeah, because it's a, it's a tax write-off, and right. people have got heritages out there. The only time you hear from them is when somebody dies. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you for the great information. You're quite welcome. Happy I'm holidays. Be out here. Okay. All right. Great. <laughs>